It is a wide open evening. Any disease, any medical question, it is Ask Anything. Tonight, on call with the Prairie Doc. Good evening and welcome to On Call with the Prairie Doc. We're here for you all tonight. Ask any medical question and we'll do our best to provide an answer. But first, a look at this week's Prairie Doc quiz question. Multiple choice this week. The first widely used vaccine prevented which of the following diseases? Influenza A, B, rabies, C, smallpox, or D, tetanus? Viewers who call in the correct answer will be entered into a drawing to win a copy of the book, The Picture of Health. Each of Dr. Holmes' essays, originally written for On Call with Prairie Doc, comes with a wonderful accompanying photograph by Dr. Judith Peterson. We will announce the answer and the winner at the end of this show. Remember, you only have 10 minutes to get your answer in. We answer your questions about, well, anything medical as they are called in or sent to us via Facebook or email. Call in questions to 1-888-376-6225 or send us an email to the address on the screen. Joining us tonight in the studio is Dr. Rachel Suni, Avera Medical Group Brookings Family Medicine, Brookings, South Dakota. And remotely via Zoom, is Dr. Don Nielsen, Rapid City Emergency Services, Monument Health, ER Physician, Rapid City, South Dakota. Welcome, Rachel, welcome, Don. Thank you. Thanks for having us. <laughs> Thank you. And so, Rachel, tell me a little bit about yourself. Sure, so like you said, I practice now in Brookings. I am originally from Brandon, South Dakota, uh, and then I attended Mount Marty University and then University of South Dakota for medical school. Uh, I now live just by Volga with my three little girls and husband and puppy and yeah, it's kind of the gist of it. I bet they're watching right now, so you better give them a hello. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> and Don, tell us a little bit about yourself. Um, well, I uh, graduated high school in Yankton and went to uh, college at Mount Marty also. I attended medical school at nice. USD and uh, graduated in 2009 and went out to uh, University of Wisconsin in Madison um, to do my emergency medicine uh, training. Um, I'm married to uh, Marcy, who is also a physician here in Rapid City. She does internal medicine. And uh, we have two kids, uh, Isabella, who's three, and Madeline, who is seven months. Wonderful, wonderful. And, uh, and Don, you come from a pretty medical family, if you wanna fill us in, please. Yeah, I, I do. Um, my father, was an orthopedic surgeon in Yankton for about 20 years. Um, my older brother is now an orthopedic oncologist at uh, University of Milwaukee, um, or not University of Milwaukee, uh, MCW, uh, Medical College of Wisconsin. Um, and, uh, and he, uh, we're all very proud of him. He does some pretty amazing work uh, with uh, different bone tumors and soft tissue uh, tumors. And then um, my, uh, I have a, another brother who is a anesthesiologist in residency in Omaha. Um, and he has actually signed on to come out to Rapid City uh, this summer. And then I have another brother who is starting medical school or in now in his third year. So he's getting closer to the, to the end of that. And, um, and then I have a, another brother who is a vice president of a bank in uh, Minneapolis. Wonderful, wonderful. Well, I, it, I'm so glad to have both of you on, on to get, together with me uh, tonight. Uh, I, thankfully, I get to have so many friends on the show with me at various times, but I completely forgot you guys were both went to Mount Marty, so yeah. it's the <laughs> Mount Marty night. Yeah. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> Well, it's an Ask Anything show, so we'll see what we end up covering tonight. But uh, I've got some questions already, so I think we'll, we'll get started. Um, this person says their elderly aunt seems to get urinary tract infections frequently. Is there a way to prevent this? 
Is she at risk because of the frequent antibiotics? Dr. Suni, would you like to cover that? Sure, yeah. So first of all, in terms of prevention and evaluation, I would say actually going into the clinic and seeing her primary care provider to get an evaluation would be a good idea. Oftentimes we culture the urine so we can see what is growing and if there might be resistance, which um, you alluded to with the recurrent antibiotics. Uh, a big part of prevention as well is trying to remain hydrated, you know, um, sometimes a cranberry supplement that I think is pretty darn well supported um, and low risk, you know, to try. Uh, but the probably most importantly is actually seeing her provider to get a workup and make sure that there's not any underlying abnormality in terms of anatomy or resistance and whatnot. Have you found estrogen to be very helpful sometimes? Yeah, in some cases, if there's some um, atrophy and whatnot with, the, with postmenopause and that sort of thing, yes, estrogen can be very helpful too. Do you see people, uh, physicians, prescribing antibiotics to prevent infection as often anymore? No, I think would be the short answer. Although in patients with recurrent UTI or urinary tract infection, sometimes we will, depending on the frequency and um, the situation. Uh, but no, I would say more often we do not do that because of the risk of um, resistance developing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely resistance become more of a problem and then we're, our hands are tied and we don't have as much to use sometimes. So we want to yeah. be, be smart about that. Another one here, my teenager's acne is flaring. What is the best over-the-counter approach to help him? Do you want to tackle that one too? Sure. Uh, I think most importantly, if you're just talking about at home, what can you do without coming into the clinic and getting medicine, um, using a, a consistent face wash such as Cetaphil or CeraVe are two good ones, uh, and using consistently, you know, twice a day, uh, frequent washing, try to avoid any irritants, um, and then using a moisturizer if there's dryness. Over the counter now, there are products like Differin, for instance, that can really help. Um, and then if those things aren't effective, then coming in to be seen is helpful too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Don, uh, in the emergency room where you've been covering the last few nights, so thanks for working post-call here for me. Absolutely. Uh, right now. Um, what are some of the changes you've been seeing this year because of COVID? It, has that affected when people come in for care or anything like that? Yeah, I'll tell you that it was actually a very bizarre thing when COVID first hit kind of in the March timeframe, March and early April. Um, kind of hit the United States. Um, there were, it was like a ghost town. And I think that that is almost universal. We, um, I'm actually also a counselor for the American College of Emergency Physicians. And so I got to communicate with different emergency doctors across the United States. And everybody pretty much had the same experience where people were just not coming in. Um, and I've definitely seen um, a lot more things that potentially could have been prevented had they had people sought medical care early. Um, I've seen some pretty tragic things that probably are the result of COVID, but not necessarily related to the illness itself. Um, so I do think that it's really important that people um, respond to their bodies when they get um, symptoms, especially of chest pain, um, to, to come in and get seen and just make sure that uh, there's nothing that's emergent about it at that time. Yeah, Don, we were talking before the show and, and you know, it, it, some sad cases where people were ignoring the signs of a heart attack and, uh, and then waited too long to come in. And it, that's absolutely. just not worth it, is it? No, a absolutely. And I mean, younger people than you would think for sure. Um, like I, I have definitely, I have had um, a few cardiac arrests in um, patients who were, you know, under 50 um and uh you know leaving behind young kids and it's it's devastating really to see um and normally it would have been something that they probably would have been seen for but they just kind of ignore their chest pain for quite some time and then by then it was too late besides so. chest pain what else is uh signs of a heart attack well you can have especially so there's lots of other things but um, exertional things. So if you're up, if you're up and moving around and you're getting chest pain when you're walking, um, that is what we would call typical angina and you should come in and be seen for that. Um, also, I, again, so it's things that when you're doing them, it's with exertion. So if you get 
exertional shortness of breath, that might be something. Um, if you just break out into a sweat with nausea and maybe you have diabetes, that could be uh, what we call an anginal equivalent. Um, you know, but any, you know, it, it is very, it can be very subtle sometimes. Um, and it, it's variable from person to person. Not everyone has crushing chest pain um, who has a, a heart, heart attack or heart issue. And so, um, yeah, chest pain, shortness of breath, nausea, sweatiness. Um, sometimes you can have just unilateral arm pain. Um, just on one side, right? Yep. Just on one side, typically. Um, but especially if that's associated with chest pain, then should definitely be seen. And not all of those are going to be, you know, heart attacks or heart issues, but it's impossible really to say without doing a workup in labs and EKG to make sure that things are okay. Yeah. Um, a man from Madison wants to know if it's okay for him to get his flu shot a week before his prostate surgery. So, Rachel, if someone came in and for their pre-op visit mm -hmm. before surgery, would you recommend their flu shot a week before surgery? Yes, I would. So we would absolutely recommend it because even just being in the hospital and going in for surgery could put you at higher risk of, you know, being out and possibly getting influenza and it's completely safe to get before surgery. Exactly. Yeah, I've had some surgeons on their sheet require it. Yeah. So um, a 55 year old man asked how he can control his expanding waistline. Any, any thoughts on that, uh, Rachel? Yeah, so that is a challenge for many, of course, and it seems like it's easier to, to gain instead of lose. And um, so I think, you know, having a good balance of physical, mental health, and also your, your diet, you know, so uh, getting some regular physical activity, whatever it might be, whatever you're able to do, start slow and then build up to more and more throughout, um, you know, week after week, and then really watching dietary intake, getting a good balance of um, a diet that's not so high in processed foods and carbohydrates and sugars and such really, really can help. A woman from Wakanda has something in her throat that makes her want to swallow and cough all the time. She has seen multiple ear, nose, and throat doctors and nothing has helped. She is wondering what else she can do. Thoughts on that? Um, <clears throat> Don, do you have any thoughts, you know, if someone came in? Well, it, it's tricky when you've already seen multiple ear, nose, and throat doctors. Um, I would say that, you know, a couple of the things that if haven't been done, you'd want to get imaging. Um, they've probably already done scopes to look in the back of the throat and see, and, you know, sometimes you can have, uh, if it's an acute thing, then sometimes you could have a, a foreign body kind of lodged back there that can potentially cause it. Um, you might want to just try to, um, you know, basically push fluids and see if if that makes any difference. Um, but like I said, imaging probably would be, would, would be the next place I would go. But probably if you've seen multiple ear, nose, and throat doctors, I don't think that I have anything else to, to necessarily offer that particular patient. Uh, unfortunately. Yeah, you know, it, it can be hard because, you know, sometimes when you s start with a specialist, mm -hmm. uh, they they might focus on their area and, and you know, and I, I would think that it's common enough where the ear, nose, and throat doc might look into possible GI causes, yeah. but what are some thoughts you've had, Rachel, when listening right now? Yeah, so I think that's true. I think, you know, ENT is wonderful, but maybe going back again to a primary care provider and trying to decide, do you need to see a different specialist or can we do more? So yeah, you know, you think about reflux, is it some silent reflux that's causing that constant irritation? Um, and then even maybe evaluation of the thyroid. Again, I think they would probably pick up on that already at ENT since that's part of their wheelhouse. But uh, yeah, maybe going kind of back to your home base and then rehashing or kind of rethinking what other things that are less common may be contributing. Yeah, you know, in general, I think if, if, if you feel like something's wrong and, 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 and you need another opinion, I don't think any of us would be offended if they no. found another opinion from someone no, until they got the not. answer they needed. Yep. Um, one gentleman who is taking blood pressure medication to lower his blood pressure has a normal blood pressure that is slightly below normal and around 
119 over 70, which is, you know, good, good pressure. Are his mm -hmm. medications working too well that he should look into other medications? And is he at risk for any long-term effects for continued low blood pressure? So I think one question is, you know, what's really low blood pressure yeah. and what, what, what are our goal blood pressures, Rachel? Right, so it depends on age. Um, so for most people, we want them to be less than 140 over 90. Uh, for hypertension, sometimes we'll give a little wiggle room higher in elderly. Uh, so that would be part of the decision making um, and how high risk that person is for a fall, say if they were to stand up and get dizzy. So if there were symptoms related to the blood pressure being that low consistently, then I would say it's worth a discussion with the provider. Uh, so like if dizzy with standing or real fatigued or um, things like that but but otherwise no I don't think it would be harmful for him to be at that pressure I would be quite thrilled as his doctor to have it there yeah you know <laughs> sir, new, new guidelines had even recommended in general a, a lower you know less than 120 over 80 mm -hmm. but it can depend on the situation like you said and mm -hmm. if there's if you're having symptoms or not yeah um, now granted in the emergency room the blood pressures are usually a lot higher and uh, uh, do you do you how often do you pay attention to that or when do you get worried in the emergency room so great question blood pressure is kind of a um, people are very concerned about their blood pressure that's for sure there's lots of people who are out there taking it and some people are totally ignoring it right so there's this two vast ways of looking at your health right but um, in general when I talk to people because I often have them ask me, hey, what do you think about my blood pressure? It's kind of low, don't you think? It, you know, and it might be 100 over 60, and I'll say, are you having any symptoms? Well, no, I'm not. Well, that's great. If I could take that blood pressure, I would take it right now, for me, right now, I'll take it. <laughs> um, but, you know, when, when, I, when I start to think about blood pressures that are getting too high, um, you know, when they start to get over 200 on the top number and 120 on the bottom number, that's when I start to say, okay, that probably needs to be treated. Um, emergently. Emergently. Right. Um, yeah. If you're having symptoms with them, definitely, right? So if you're having chest pain, headache, um, any type of you know numbness, tingling, weakness on one side or the other, all those things need to be seen right away, um, kind of regardless of the blood pressure, but they may be related to the blood pressure. Um, and so, uh, you know, like I said, emergently, I will probably treat um, two, 200 systolic um, on the top number and then 120 uh, on the bottom number. Um, people come in all the time and they'll say, well, what about my blood pressure? It's 160 and say they just had, you know, a kidney stone or some other very painful um, uh, illness. And I'll tell those people, yeah, I'm not that concerned about that right now. But it is something that you definitely want to get followed up because if you have a blood pressure that's resting with no symptoms of 160, you probably need to be on blood pressure medicine. Not probably, you do need to be on blood right. pressure medicine. Yeah, um, and so, but it, it's important to take the context of the situation of what their other symptoms actually are. Yeah, and it, it's interesting with the perspective of the ER physician and the primary care physician. Mm -hmm. But the bottom line is if you're concerned or if you're having symptoms, or even if you're not having symptoms, periodically get your blood pressure checked or, and regularly see your, your doctor to help stay on top of it. Boosting your immune system health is especially vital this year, and your diet plays a big role in that. Prairie Doc reporter Carter Schmidt talked to registered dietitian Katie Vanderwall about the importance of eating nutritious foods. Proper nutrition is gonna help you fight off those viruses quicker. So making sure that all year long, but more specifically this time of year, you focus on color and balance in your diet. Make sure that that plate that you've got in front of you at every single meal has a variety of different colors because each color on your plate is gonna offer you different nutrients specifically. So on top of that, there are a few that are more helpful with immune system function, and that would be vitamin C, which is a pretty commonly known one, which is gonna be in citrus, tomato, broccoli, peppers, those types of vegetables and fruits. Vitamin E can be helpful as well, very protective to the immune system. That's going to be found in nuts and seeds, um, leafy greens, and oils. And then the last two would be zinc, 
which is going to be in meats, shellfish, eggs, and then dried beans and peas, and then also vitamin D as well, which is going to be in fish, cheese, eggs, and nuts. I think the biggest part is to just really focus on a healthy diet. Try to avoid so much junk food. Try to avoid um, during the busy season running through the fast food restaurants and that kind of stuff and just making sure that your plate is balanced. It's pretty easy when you're on the run not to have balance on that plate and not to have much color either. Look for what you're craving. If you're craving salty, look up and down that aisle. You might be surprised at what you can find even in the packaged snack food aisle that is a little bit more nutritious, a little more vegetable based, a little more fruit based. Maybe go to the vegetable section and look for veggies and dip if you're craving something crunchy or salty. If you're craving sweet, same thing. Look for those fruits and vegetables. Even look for some new recipes. You know, maybe you can find a recipe that has granola that's going to give you the sweet things, that's going to give you the crunch that you're looking for, and it's something a little bit different that you can add to your yogurt parfait in the morning. This time of year, A, we've got those viruses and those germs floating around, and we really want to prepare our bodies to protect against them. Number two is that this is also the time of year that a lot of us love to show our love to each other with foods and treats and snacks. And it's kind of a pastime, you know, in the Midwest, we like to cook and bake and share. So make sure that we don't overdo that type of stuff and that we're not using our calories in that aspect and focusing on balance. Bringing a good fruit platter instead of a dessert platter might be a better way to show our love to each other to really fight off and prepare for this type of season. Important stuff. Rachel, how important is proper nutrition for our overall health? Mm -hmm. So I think it's incredibly important uh, just in how you feel and um, like Katie said, you know, with our immune system and she's so right, you know, we all love to share um, recipes and food and that's kind of the way we show our love and support to others and uh, <laughs> we can do it in more healthy manners and make healthy substitutions and but I think it's incredibly um, important to our our health yeah maybe I shouldn't have brought donuts to the clinic this morning yeah yeah <laughs> everything in moderation right? right I like sweets as much as the next one right <laughs> well just remember that this is your show and your questions are important to the the discussion of our show and and, and with that said we have a few uh, COVID questions uh, sent in and I want to put a plug in for our show next week on COVID and uh, but we will maybe tackle a couple of these right right now um, one Facebook viewer asked what is your take with, uh, with your reading and research on the timing of the COVID vaccine for public availability. Rachel, do you know when, the, when are we gonna get the COVID vaccine? <laughs> that is a question that I think we would all love the answer to. Uh, I think we are getting closer. There's been some reassuring you know, moves, I guess you could say. And I think um, you know, statewide, there's been a good push to prepare for when the vaccine is here to give it. But as far as it being publicly available to all, I, I truly don't know. I would guess maybe early 2021, um, but I, I, it's hard to say. And, and I mean, just to know, you know, how much they have to manufacture and then distribute and then get those processes in place. I think, I think we have a little ways to go yet. You know, in general, it, it could, it, we want it to be in a safe manner and we want yes. it tested. And, and, and for right now, we're just gonna have to see. Yeah. see. Uh, and a gentleman had COVID back in February and the weakness lasted four months. He is curious about the evidence about whether or not a person can become reinfected with the virus. You know, Don, I'm sure you've seen some people that have been in the emergency room uh, uh, that are because they are still have symptoms too, and 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 yeah. wondering why they're not better. Um, what are some of the things you've seen? And, and as far as this question, he's had weakness lasting four months, and and evidence of people becoming reinfected. Yeah, so great question about the reinfection. And I think that the answer is, is maybe. It's a solid maybe. Um, <laughs> I, I can tell you that I have personally had a patient who had COVID in March and came back in in August. And so I said, well, 
I would think that you know this has cleared and we can go ahead and get the test and see if you know she has been reinfected you know because there are you know multiple different strains so theoretically you could get different strains of this um and so i did test her and she was positive and it's difficult for me to say yes you have a reinfection in covid so i ended up talking with one of our infectious disease doctors and um, we ordered the antibody test and her antibodies came back positive, but then we still weren't sure, well, which antibodies could she have, you know? So this is an ever evolving situation. Um, you have to remember that COVID is not even nine months old, right? So if this was a pregnancy, it hasn't even been born yet. <laughs> um, and a lot of other diseases that, we've, that we have have we've been studying them for generations. And so uh, we've learned a lot about COVID. I mean, the way that we treat it and everything else from the time when it started to now is absolutely opposite. Like we just do the opposite things um, that we were doing almost. Um, so like I said, you know, when, when is a vaccine gonna be available? You know, from my reading of both the scientific literature and um, the just general media, um, it sounds like the vaccine that they've ordered millions of doses of vaccines, regardless of whether they're gonna work. So these are already in mass production. Um, so as soon as we find one that works, uh, I think that it'll be relatively soon. Now the question is, is when are we gonna actually have all the data to say this one now works and is safe? And the answer to that question, uh, no one really knows, to be totally yeah. honest with you. But it, it does look like we're getting closer. I mean, certainly, but um, we just don't know right now. One more quick COVID question. A man from Hendricks is wondering if it's possible to contract COVID-19 by using the same washer and dryer used by someone else who used it while they had the virus. Hmm. I would say... In general, from what I understand, the answer would be no. If it was washed and then dried on high heat, that should kill the virus. And uh, I think that was a big question right away for everybody, and especially those of us in healthcare when COVID first came about, like how do we do our laundry at home? Um, but yes, if, if they were washed and then dried, I, I don't think that would be a likely transmission route. Yeah, yeah. I think yeah. We, we, we want to more be concerned if the person right next to us, if they're washing their clothes at the same time, you know, are we protected each with each other mm -hmm. at least by a mask or something, you know, or time? Mm -hmm. um, and so it's those it's those respiratory droplets that mm -hmm. that seem to be the biggest factor. Don, sorry, it looked like you were going to say something. Yeah, I was going to say, you know, when COVID first came out, we were washing our groceries. What, right? Like every almost yeah. everybody was, as far as in medicine, I know our family was. And um, that has kind of evolved and, you know, there's, there's been guidance from the CDC to say that, yeah, your chances of getting COVID from, you know, your groceries is so low, you probably don't need to be worried about it. Um, so, you know, we call the, that in medicine, we call those fomites, things that you touch that someone else has touched that has the illness. And it does pass some, some different types of illnesses um how how worried would i be about that um it, with washing so you're touching let's say the mechanics of a washer or a dryer it's uh unlikely that you're going to get covid that way especially if you're not touching your face and you're doing proper hand hygiene afterwards um i i just think that your chance is very very low yeah you know the, like I said, we've got a show next week with a few more COVID experts and, and uh, every week we're learning more things about the virus. But one thing is for sure, we do have a rise in cases right now and so we wanna do what we can to, to be careful. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. uh, a couple questions about bumps. We got a whole bunch of fresh questions here for <laughs> viewers on the show tonight. So we'll try to get through them here. A 69 year old man who took a fall recently noticed a bump on his leg just above where his Achilles is. Where is his Achilles at, Dr. Suni? On the back of the ankle area. You got it. Once his swelling went down, the bump right, the, the bump right above where his shoe rubs won't go away. Should 
he be considered for any long-term effects and what could the bump be? You know, I guess personally, I'm thinking of the Achilles, you know, you can get an Achilles tendonitis mm -hmm. uh, or maybe uh, some t little tears in the Achilles, got a bump. Now, if the shoe is rubbing, it might be even a callus yeah. or something just from rubbing, but I'd say, see, See your doctor or see the foot doctor, I suppose. Yeah, and if you had some sort of inflammation or injury and there's a fluid still present there, that can take a long time to resolve. Um, yeah. But yeah, certainly, if not sure, it's worth having somebody look at. Probably not something too worrisome, though, no, I wouldn't think. I wouldn't think. One caller has a bump on her bottom for the past month and a half. She has tried hot treatments, but nothing helps. She knows it is not a zit, cyst, or boil. Any ideas on what this bump could be and the best treatment option going forward? Well, I don't know how she knows it's not a, a you know, zit or bump or boil, but mm -hmm. those, that would be a common spot for a boil that mm -hmm. sometimes needs to get lanced, lanced open. Um, but other thoughts on, on, on the bump on the bottom? Yeah, I think other, you know, you think about if she's not real mobile, is there a sore on the back? Um, there's, you know, if right in the middle of the bottom, we think about pilonidal cysts and things like that, that do need to be treated and, and taken care of so they don't worsen. Um, yeah. So yeah, it's hard to say without knowing more. Uh, Don, yes. here's an emergency question. A woman's husband is having intense side pain. He is young and a painter. He has been taken to the emergency room to ensure it wasn't caused by his heart or lungs and he was cleared. Is there anything else he can do? So it depends on where the side pain is, right? So if you're talking about flank pain, meaning kind of in the abdomen, but just kind of the back of the abdomen, um, then you could consider, you know, a kidney stone. Um, you could consider a kidney infection. Um, if he's a painter, it's possible that this could be muscular or um, just related to his back. One of the things that I would recommend for sure, is, after I had seen and evaluated and made sure that it was nothing that was dangerous, is I would recommend stretching exercises. Um, painters are often doing things overhead and potentially can strain um, their, the muscles in the back that um, basically make us uh, stand on two legs, right? So the erector spinae, it uh, starts basically kind of at your bottom and goes all the way up basically to your neck and, and, uh, and it allow, allows us to stand upright rather than be on all fours like, uh, like you know, dogs and cats and everything. Um, so that can certainly be some part of the problem sometimes if uh, someone is, is standing and overhead painting a lot. Um, but uh, yeah, it's difficult to say exactly based on that description of where the pain is. Yeah, excellent. And once again, time to get another opinion or see a regular doctor. The emergency room doc often will rule out the emergencies. Got to rule out the emergencies. Doesn't mean nothing's going on. So right. Absolutely. The, the federal government has the goal of vaccinating 70% of the population against influenza. The latest data shows that less than half of Americans get vaccinated, although I know it's more in South Dakota. <laughs> Prairie Doc reporter Tori Burnt interviewed Dr. Rebecca Vandekop about why vaccinations are especially important this year. My car sales pitch on how to, why, why we get the flu vaccine. The flu vaccine is not always perfect, and you know it doesn't always protect against influenza as completely as we would like because it's a guess. They have to you know, um, predict what strains are going to be prevalent, and they're not always right. So it's not going to 100% prevent influenza, but it does make a significant difference in reducing the complications of influenza, reducing hospitalizations from influenza, and deaths from influenza. And in my mind, what we're looking at with vaccines is to try to prevent people from having severe illness or dying. And no matter what strains they get in the vaccine, it does do that every year. The high dose flu shot is exactly what it sounds like. It's higher dose than the regular dose. Um, it is intended for people who are over age 65. Uh, no matter what kind of health conditions they have, everybody over 65 should get the high dose vaccine. And then people under 65 would get the low dose or the regular dose vaccine. We recommend doing the flu shot in the fall. 
typically September, October, November is, is kind of the time that we really push flu vaccines. I'd say October this year has been really the sweet spot uh, where we've really been pushing it hard. Um, but we can do them even through early winter, um, you know, into January and February. If people haven't been vaccinated, uh, they can still get the vaccine at that time. The pneumonia vaccine can be given year round. Um, that is not a seasonal illness, so it can be given any time. Um, that is going to be given to people who are over age 65 um, or people who are under 65 who have certain health conditions, uh, like if they've got diabetes or they've had their spleen removed or uh, you know, a couple of other conditions as well, but mostly over age 65. COVID-19 makes it very complicated. <laughs> So we are you know, pleading with people to get the flu vaccine this year. Um, you know, we don't know, if, are, are people going to be sicker if they have influenza and COVID at, at the same time? I would presume they probably would be. Um, plus influenza and COVID symptoms, there's a lot of overlap. So if you have one, we have to assume you have the other as well. Um, so I, it's going to just make things very complicated as far as quarantining, um, you know, keeping schools open, keeping businesses open. Um, and trying to keep people out of the hospital. So influenza vaccine this year is, is huge. Yes, thank you, Dr. Vandekop. And, and she touched on the pneumonia shot. And to rehash again, who should get the pneumonia shot, how often? Yes, yeah, so anyone over the age of 65, and then there's a number of uh, patients less than 65 that should also get the pneumonia shot, so such as if they have COPD or asthma or smoker, um, to name a few. Yeah, very yeah. good. Yeah. And the flu shot, have you had more patients want the flu shot this year, less? Do you think it's gonna be much of a flu season? Um, I think flu is very hard to predict, so it's hard to say, but I do think we have seen more people get vaccinated this year. I feel as though many people have been more open to it and, and at least want to have a discussion if they haven't gotten it in the past, um, which is wonderful. It's I, good. Would, I would sure hate to get the flu and COVID or get the flu and then have to get tested for COVID and yeah. not know which I have. So yeah. there's enough reasons there, I think. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, we've got a bunch of questions and just a little time, so we're going to try to get through, through them here. Um, a man has a sharp pain in his right foot, mostly at night, yet is not diabetic. He, was, he is wondering what else he can do. Don, what would be a sharp pain in the foot? And, and we know for sure they're not diabetic and it's just on one side. So um, important things to look for, you know, redness and making sure that, you know, there's not evidence of infection and where the pain is in the foot. Um, certainly this can still be neuropathic, meaning um, from a nerve uh, and potentially can be treated with medications, um, but you would wanna be, uh, wanna be evaluated for that. If it's at the bottom of the foot, it, it may be uh, plantar fasciitis if, um, if it seems to be getting worse with uh, you know, ambulation or you're doing a lot of things on your feet. Or, um, so you know, a wide variety depends on the location of the foot, of, of the pain of the foot, um, and, uh, and whether it's over a joint, um, can be tendonitis also. Um, so lots of things there that are, that are potential and definitely needs to be evaluated with a physical exam. Yeah, and, and the great answer, the only thing I'd maybe add to, I think about it, you know, maybe a pinched nerve or something that could radiate yes. all the way down to the foot too. So it could even be a back issue, you know. Yeah. Right. Um, uh, one gentleman called who had heart surgery in the past. The other day he felt a ripping sensation in his heart and it was a feeling he hadn't felt before. Should he get it checked out? He does not feel any different since. Don, should someone get a ripping sensation checked out in their heart? That would be on the list. That's on the list. Please come in and get that looked at. Yeah. Um, yeah, there's no question about that. That's a, a very straightforward, you need to get looked at, especially if you've had any type of coronary artery disease, meaning you've had a heart surgery or a stent or you're diabetic or anything like that. That is a no brainer. Please Don, what's an at. aortic dissection? So an aortic dissection is a tear in the inside lining of uh, the large artery that comes off the heart 
um, it can start right off the heart and it can start off of um, kind of uh, further away from the heart. Um, and it is a, uh, an emergency for certain. It uh, would need to be potentially fixed surgically depending on what type of dissection it is. Um, sometimes they're managed medically, uh, again, depending on what type. And that's something I think of anyway when I hear ripping, ripping sensation. Mm -hmm. So, because literally something is, is ripping. Um, Dr. Uh, Suni, uh, is there a medication, uh, a Facebook viewer asked, that will shrink uterine fibroids without affecting fertility? Hmm. Yeah. I'm not sure I know for for sure what the answer to that would be. That would be a good place to ask OBGYN. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'm not sure, especially in regards to the fertility, you know, because oftentimes we would yeah. you think about different birth control and whatnot. So. Right. You know, and... You know, sometimes, certainly, I, I, I know that surgically, you know, they can embolize, cut off the blood flow to one of those fibroids mm -hmm. and to help fertility. I mean, mm -hmm. sometimes you want to get uterine fibroids taken care of to help fertility, too. Right. So, right. like you said, another, you know, good reason to get in with one of our OB-GYNs and, yeah. and uh, um, it's certainly uh, worth looking into. Um, a woman is experiencing abdominal pain that mimics gallbladder attacks. The blood work and ultrasound were negative. Now she has a CT setup. What might the scan possibly find, Rachel? What are they looking at for that CT scan, do you suppose? Well, that's challenging. I think, uh, you know, the CT scan can be the next step to look and make sure we're not missing, you know, something going on with the pancreas or the stomach or just anywhere in the bowel. And the CT can give us a good, uh, good view of all the solid organs. Um, additionally, sometimes gallbladder pain can be a little tricky where the, if it's just, um, kind of coming and going that the labs and the ultrasound are normal. Oftentimes we'll even order like a HIDA scan or, you know, kind of take it a step further. So, um, I think the CT scan sounds like it's to rule out anything else that we may be missing by chasing the gallbladder. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, we'll try to do even brief answers to some of this. A Sioux City, Iowa woman has a lot of acid reflux and she has recently been having discomfort under her rib cage on the right. She is wondering if it possibly due to an epigastric hernia. Don, what do you think a, a pain under the rib cage on the right? Uh, I the differential is very wide for that, but yeah. um, specific, specifically if she's asking about whether it's uh, a hiatal hernia, I think is what she's wondering about, um, it, that's possible. Um, but again, that's something that certainly would need, need to be looked at. Um, you would want, uh, if you have new pain on the, on the, in the chest, on the right side especially, you would at least want to get uh, looked at and ha potentially have a chest x-ray to make sure that you don't have anything else that's that's abnormal on that and that can also potentially diagnose a hiatal hernia um, very easily um, potentially you might may need to get started on new medications but it is something that you would want to be looked at with your doctor yeah and you know we hear how and have seen how women can have unusual symptoms even with heart disease too so mm -hmm. we Absolutely. we can't just assume it's not the heart either um, a woman wants to know what treatment is there for a bile duct cancer when chemo is not working. That's a tough situation. Um, if you had a patient coming to you, Rachel, with that question, what would you say? I would touch base with their oncologist that they're already working with to see, you know, what other options they knew of. I would also offer to reach out to a second opinion for them, you know, a, a clinic nearby or um, a hospital nearby or um, kind of help them pursue trials possibly. But I would say most times we're lucky enough to have oncologists that do that, um, really pursue all the avenues. So. I would just work as a team with their oncologist to try to figure out the best options and goals of care. Yeah. yeah. Uh, a Rapid City woman is 86 and is taking Prolia because of poor bone density. She is not pleased with the side effects and is wondering if there are any other medications she could take. Poor bone density, Prolia. You know, I'm, I'm assuming she's been on Fosamax, some of the regular mm -hmm. ones. What else would you recommend? Yeah, we have a number of different medications that we can use for osteoporosis specifically. And, and yes, each one has its pros and cons and side effects. So I would say she should absolutely touch base with her provider and, and talk about a different option. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, Don, what should people do to help stay out of the emergency room? 
So number one would be going to make sure that you have regular medical screening, make sure that you get your vaccinations that are required, especially um, your kids, make sure your kids are vaccinated. Um, you wanna uh, make sure that you're you know, paying attention to things before they become out of control. So if you start to get, you know, a, a nagging pain in your back and, and you know, touch base with your doctor. I mean, that's, it's something that's totally reasonable and easy to do. Um, you know, we, obviously I'm never gonna discourage anyone from seeking emergency medical care. If you feel like you've got an emergency, you should go in. There's yeah. not any question about that. Thank but, you, you know, the, the normal preventative care and making sure that you're being seen by your regular doctor to get um, your medications checked and make sure and, and your medications uh, prescribed as, as needed and making sure that you're taking them as prescribed. Yeah. Um, if you ever, I, I talk with patients all the time. Thank, thank you, Don. Sorry, I'm gonna, I'm sorry. So sorry, I'm gonna uh, cut you yeah, off there sorry. for a second. I'll let Rachel have one minute to finish off before we wrap it up. And, and, and so sorry for all the people, so many questions that we, we have that we didn't get to quite yet. But uh, uh, you know, the, the, we're seeing a lot of really sick COVID patients right now. Mm -hmm. and, and Rachel, is there any particular message you'd like to share here at the end of, end of the show too? Yeah, sure. Um, specifically in regards to COVID, I think th my message would be that we are all tired. Um, the public is tired. The medical community is tired. Everybody is tired of it, but it is still here. And especially now it's hitting here in South Dakota and it's real and it's scary. Um, so I think just for the public to do what you can, just think of other people and um, wear a mask, social distance, limit how much you're going out. You can still do some things, you know, we're going to school and we're, you know, work and things like that, but do it in a safe manner and do it. If you don't want to do it for yourself and do it for everybody else you know, um, and that will help us tremendously. That's right. Yeah. And now for the answer to tonight's Prairie Doc quiz question. The first widely used vaccine prevented which of the following diseases? A, influenza, B, rabies, C, smallpox, D, tetanus. Answer, C, smallpox. Edward Jenner is credited with developing the first vaccine in 1796, although the benefit of getting the milder cowpox to prevent smallpox was known before then. The winner of tonight's quiz is Anthony Furman from Flandreau, South Dakota. Thank you, Anthony, for participating. A book will be in the mail soon. We'll be right back after this. Welcome to your Prairie Doc Library at www.prairiedoc.org. Wherever you live or travel, you and your family can enjoy free and easy access 24 hours a day. Search for a specific topic, browse through the television shows, radio programs, and blog page. You, your family, and friends around the world can learn from physicians and other health professionals answering questions on a variety of medical topics. Visit your Prairie Doc Library today at www.prairiedoc.org. Indeed, there is a lot we can worry about in the world today. It can be so easy to let those problems invade our thoughts as we try to get some sleep. Ideally, our bedrooms are a sanctuary of peace and quiet and a place of rest. But televisions, phones, computers, and other devices bring the world and its problems to our beds, and this is not healthy. Sleep is one of the best ways to help keep our immune system strong to fight off infection and illnesses. And now more than ever, it is important to give our bodies the best chance at fighting off a cold, flu, and disease. Adults need seven to eight hours of sleep every night, while teenagers and elementary children need nine to 10 hours. Regular exercise is one way to help us sleep better. It is best to exercise during the day rather than right before bedtime. We sleep better if we avoid eating large meals within two to three hours of going to bed. But this doesn't mean we must go to bed hungry. We can reach for a healthy, small snack like a carrot sticks or apple slices. It can also help to keep a regular schedule and have a bedtime ritual, such as brushing our teeth after that final snack. Reduce caffeine and alcohol consumption, especially near bedtime. And when stressed, we can prepare for better sleep if we take time to relax by gentle stretching, meditation, prayer, 
or deep breathing. We can help ourselves by changing our behaviors, but if we experience persistent heartburn or reflux, restless legs, snoring, daytime fatigue, or use the bathroom frequently at night, it's time to visit the doctor for assistance. Finally, it helps to keep the bedroom comfortable, quiet, dark, and cool. Despite all their conveniences, consider removing those electronic devices from the bedroom. Screen time before bed, whether watching television, phones, or laptops, is a large and growing reason for insomnia. The bright light from screens tricks our minds into thinking it is daytime, so be sure to use the night filter to decrease the amount of light they emit into our eyes. And since our bedroom is meant for sleeping, why not set a firm time to turn off all the devices for the day? You better get up! People die in their sleep. That's what my dad would say when he was trying to get me out of bed as a teenager. While true, the reverse is also valid. People can die from problems stemming from lack of sleep. So let's get some sleep and stay healthy out there, people. A big thank you to our guests, Dr. Rachel Suni and Dr. Don Nielsen, for volunteering their time to add their experience and knowledge to our discussion tonight. Okay. If you would like more information about this program, or to see and hear more episodes of this program, please like and follow us on Facebook and YouTube, or visit us at prairiedoc.org. And be sure to look for the podcast of this program, Prairie Doc On Call, wherever you get your podcasts. Pancreatic cancer took the life of the founder of this program, Dr. Rick Holm. An upcoming event is designed to promote awareness of the disease. Light the Capital Purple for Pancreatic Cancer will take place in Pier this Sunday, November 1st at 3 p.m. It will be live streamed and archived at drgnews.com. That does it for tonight. From all of us here at On Call with the Prairie Doc, until next time, stay healthy out there, people. We've been living with the pandemic for almost a year now. It is time for us to take a look at where we are today. Stories of COVID-19, next time On Call with the Prairie Doc. For nearly 20 years, the Prairie Doc programs have provided health care information in our state and across the region. Hello, I'm Dr. Jennifer May of Rapid City, and I serve as a board member on the Healing Words Foundation, which provides the funding for the Prairie Doc programs. Each week, our Prairie Doc and other medical professionals volunteer many hours to share science-based truth on health care, on public television, on the radio, in our newspapers, and online. And best of all, everyone has free and easy access to the entire Prairie Doc Library. I ask you to make a donation. Please help us continue this important work. Go to prairiedoc.org and make a donation today. Thank you. Major funding for On Call with the Prairie Doc has been provided by. Avera is a proud sponsor of On Call with the Prairie Doc on South Dakota Public Broadcasting. Larson Manufacturing is proud to support On Call with the Prairie Doc as it continues to open doors for important medical information. And with the ongoing support of these individuals and institutions, Brookings Health System, Ophthalmology Limited, South Dakota Academy of Family Physicians, Avera Heart Hospital, Fishback Financial Corporation, South Dakota Foundation for Medical Care, 
Dakota Allergy and Asthma, Vance Thompson Vision, Black Hills Medical Society, Brookings Madison Flandreau District Medical Society, Sioux Falls District Medical Society, Yankton District Medical Society, Aberdeen District Medical Society, Urology Specialists, Orthopedic Institute, Physicians Care Sanford Clinic Community Service Committee, Lake Ponset Sailing Academy, Aberdeen Asthma and Allergy, Dakota Bank, South Dakota American College of Physicians, and Swift Telecommunications.